Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a great privilege and honor for me to present another lecture hosted by Kaufman Research Center for Global Social Studies titled as Transitions to What or Why the Anthropology of Money and Finance Matters. My name is Tamina Okoroshvili and I'm a member of Polanyi Center and today I will be moderating this event. Uh, so now to move on, the, before we uh, introduce the speakers, a few words about the Polanyi. Uh, the center um, promotes comparative and interdisciplinary studies with a global perspective. Our aim is to scrutinize historically evolving transnational linkages, persistent inequalities and conflicts between social groups, communities, and various regions of the world. Center also takes a critical stance to uncover entrenched uh, ideas uh, that justify established regimes of global governance that perpetuate forms of redistribution and inequalities. And of course, it continues the intellectual heritage of the <coughs> Um, and now um, to move on the, um, the topic of our lecture today, uh, the, the lecture will touch upon the issue of where does money come from and who controls it against the background of the powerful worldwide financial expansion that ushered in a series of major financial crises between 2007 and 14, some new old truths have been relearned. Uh, this talk by anthropologists uh, John Cobb and Chris Hahn, who also co-edited the book about financialization and relational approaches, which was published in 2020, will dwell on this recent learning about the deeply political nature of money and finance, including the uh, ongoing conversations around it. They will place the conversation inevitably in the context of pandemic finance, the apparent return of inflation, talk of rising interest rates, the upcoming green transition and the rise of China. And uh, now to move on, I'll introduce briefly the speakers. Um, so the first uh, first uh, speaker today will be John Kalb, who is a professor of uh, social anthropology um, at the University of uh, Bergen in Norway, where he leads the front lines of value projects. Um, from 2003 to 2018, he was a professor of sociology and Social Anthropology at the Central European University here in Budapest. He's a, he's a visiting scholar at the European University Institute, CUNY Graduate Center, the Freedom Institute for Advanced Studies, the, Univers uh, the University of Melbourne, and the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology in Hale. Uh, John has worked on value, class, labor, finance, globalization and development, post-socialism, and the rise of the non-nationalist right. And the second uh, respected speaker is Chris Hahn, who is an uh, Emeritus Director of the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology and a Fellow of Corpus Christi College in Cambridge. Uh, so we'll, uh, John will start uh, his speech, which will be around 35 to 40 minutes, followed by Chris Hahn, 10 to 15 minutes. And after that, we will have time uh, for the questions from audience, which is very much welcome. And on this note, I give floor to Professor John Kalb. Please. Thank you very much, Dama. Uh, so, so I, I have a talk here, um, which is rooted in the introduction that I wrote for the book that I did together with Chris Ham, that we did together with uh, a group of six postdocs at the MPI in Halle, uh, Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology. Um, there's a lot of capital in this talk. There's a lot of finance in the talk. There's a lot about quantitative easing. There's a lot of attention to two different theories of money, the state theory of money and the liberal theory of money, which is also a theory that can be summarized as metalism. But of course, this is also a special day um, in the sense that the world has changed a little bit today. And so inevitably in the talk, I think I should also touch on war. Uh, um, but I start with what I wanted to do, and then I would sort of improvise and, and bend it towards war uh, and imperial competition in financialized context um, later on. Now, let us clear up the key terms first. Capitalism, a social formation, not an economy. A social formation driven by private organization, appropriation, allocation of the social surplus. 
a social order that rests on the endless accumulation of capital. Capital, not just monetary or patrimonial wealth, as recent popular texts from Piketty to Graeber suggest, but rather value in motion, a la Harvey, expressed in and traversing those concrete forms of appearance. Finance, money capital, money begetting money, via the circulation of property titles with legally enforceable claims to future monetary streams derived from these titles. The driver of speculative and fictitious accumulation. Financialization or financial expansion, the process by which the reproduction of societies becomes ever more dependent on the circulation of finance, credit, debt, and on the logic of speculative money capital. A, a historical Link. It's going well up there. It's going well. Uh, I'm just uh, muting some people who are not muted. Sorry. That's a problem to fast. No. Uh, oh, no. Okay. It's okay now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Financialization or financial expansion, the process by which the reproduction of societies becomes ever more dependent on the circulation of finance, credit, debt, and on the logic of speculative money capital. A historical predicament in which the imperatives of finance increasingly capture and dictate the social and political forms that feed it. So financialization, not just as an economic phenomenon, but as a particular uh, force within societies, the structuration of society, and, and basically about social relationships, power relationships, culture, the imagination. As Arrighi and Friedman have explained, such financial expansions tend to happen at the end of historical cycles of material expansion, when the returns on investment in existing lines of material production and their associated life forms decline and surplus capital begins to see the speculative way out setting up new circuits and spatial fixes, assembling new landscapes of accumulation, new productions, and new speculative asset classes, from technology to real estate, cities, states, human capital, outer space, and crypto, for instance. Now, the last 40 years have seen a major financial expansion. Ushering like early financializations in a series of financial crises with turbulent political ramifications. Before, during, and after these recent crises, global indebtedness kept steadily increasing. It is now around 300% of gross global product. I think it's a little bit more now, it might be 340. The financialized predicament of humanity is therefore more profound and more universal than ever before. Every life course and social biography anywhere on the globe is now really nearly infested with and structured by moments of financialized extraction on behalf of the owners of money capital. This happens via public and private relations of indebtedness, of course, but also via governments whose policies are increasingly forced to answer to the need for national economies to generate value, meaning surplus value. In other words, future returns for creditors. In some highly financialized advanced locations, uh, like the US or Japan, public and private indebtedness together reach as high as 500% of GDP or more. Others like Germany uh, are still slightly repressed, um, both in, in inherent ideologies and in practice. The exact relations, proportions, and articulations are variegated. Some peripheral societies, many in Central Africa, are still only weakly bankable. Others, post socialist Azerbaijan, these are quotations that we discuss also in the book. Uh, post-socialist Azerbaijan, North Macedonia, Sarajevo, for example, are becoming financialized as part of an elite project that seeks to monopolize the credit flows for their own expanded reproduction. Others again, often post-colonial nations like South Africa, India, and much of Latin America, are witnessing political projects both on the right and the left that aim to lubricate incipient financialization with modestly redistributive transfer programs. Now, urban construction and the ground rent are key mechanisms everywhere for financialized accumulation. But places like Turkey, Ireland, Spain, China, uh, perhaps also Hungary in a way, or in any case Budapest, have seen momentous financialized growth machines emerging around construction, real estate, 
and variegated types of urbanization, amounting to anywhere between 20 and 30 uh, percent of GDP per year for the construction sector. Now, the financial crisis, crisis, and is and their unfinished aftermath. Uh, have been a feast of accelerated learning about money finance and capitalism in general. Anthropology has been an active contributor to that learning alongside history, literary studies, feminism, philosophy, sociology, and political economy. Economics as an academic discipline and as a managerial profession for the daily running of capitalism as we know it, has naturally found it harder to allow heterodox thinking in its midst, and yet the number of contrarian economists and their blogs has multiplied. The cumulative insights of these scholarly endeavors are exciting. Gone is the stillness of neoliberal and neoclassical truisms perpetually recycled during the 1989 till 2007 Belle Epoque. Heterodox economics commentators like Paul Krigman, Adam Tooze, Thomas Piketty have become global celebrities. And there has also been a revival of Marxist thinking uh, more in academia than outside. Um, of course, in anthropology, uh, David Graeber has played a big role, uh, the dead book, but uh, you know, around Graeber, there's a sort of uh, resurgence of economic anthropology going on with a lot of attention to financialization, to credit and debt. Um, there's also sort of revitalization, also a long Graeber um, um, in the interest for historical anthropology or long-term visions. And so anthropology is an, an active contributor uh, to this all. Now, um, I'm going to sort of put on the table a very big historical vision. Um, and I think we need that vision in order to understand the peculiarity of the West, in a way, and also perhaps the peculiarity of capitalism. Of course, the two uh, are interacting. Um, so the West of Eurasia, I hear Chris listening. The West of Eurasia is a space where the liberal theory of money, money emerging out of the practicalities of market exchanges. And so in any case, the, the liberal ideology of money, which emphasizes money uh, and the origins of money in market exchange, has been sort of dominant over the ages. And perhaps we can make the claim that since the Greeks, in any case, the liberal theory of money has been sort of dominant. In the world. We can also call this a metallism, a metallist. So money emerges as a practical way uh, in which exchange can happen. And certainly when exchange happens over longer distances and uh, with larger quantities and uh, a, a greater variety of goods, uh, money becomes, in, in that sort of fiction, money sort of emerges automatically as a sort of entrepreneurial invention. Now, the opposite of that case uh, is the state theory of money. And it's exactly that state theory of money that has been sort of redeveloped and rediscovered in the last 20 years, um, ultimately ushering in modern monetary theory. Uh, so Stephanie Kelton, uh, and let us say, uh, the left of the Democratic Party. Now, the state theory of money proposes a completely different origin of money, and that is in state-citizen relationships or state-subject relationships. And so money emerges um in relation to taxation now the state theory of money one can say rather schematically has been basically embodied in the whole historical experience uh, of everything from the levant further to the east now there's this fantastic quote uh, from marco polo um you know, a Venetian merchant, uh, 14th century, um, who sits in a prison, uh, I think in Genoa, um, and tells about the stories, uh, uh, his experiences of Song China. And here his 
is observation about money in China. Money that works by uh, the state theory of money rather than the metalist or the liberal theory of money. And I read the code, the code as a whole because I love it. It's a beautiful code and it gives you a very, very clear idea of uh, where these contrasts, in fact, are. And you can say that Song China was perhaps the historical instantiation of, let us say, a full 100% uh, state theory of money realized. Here's Marco Polo, and the passage is called, How the Great Khan Causes the Bark of Trees Made into Something Like Paper to Pass for Money All Over His Country. The Emperor's Mint is in this city of Kambaluk. You might say he has the secret of alchemy in perfection, for he makes his money after this fashion. He makes them take off the bark of a mulberry tree the leaves of which are the fruit of the silkworms, and these trees being so numerous that whole districts are full of them. What they take is a certain fine white blast or skin, and this they make into resembling sheets of paper, but black. When these sheets have been prepared, they are cut up into pieces of different sizes. All these pieces of paper are issued with as much solemnity and authority as if they were of pure gold or silver. And on every piece, a variety of officials have to write their names and to put their seals. And when all is prepared duly, the chief officer deputed by the Khan smears the seal entrusted to him with vermilion and impresses it on the paper so that the form of the seal remains imprinted on it in a red. The money is then authentic. Anyone forging it will be punished with death. And the Khan causes every year to be made such a vast quantity of money, which costs him nothing, that it must equal in amount all the treasure of the world. With these pieces of paper, God continues, he causes all payments on his own account to be made. And he makes them to pass current universally over all his kingdoms and provinces and territories, and whithersoever his power and sovereignty extends. And nobody, however important, dares to refuse them on pain of death. And indeed, everybody takes them readily. For wheresoever a person may go throughout the great Khan, Khan's dominions, he shall find these pieces of paper current and shall be able to transact all sales and purchase of goods by means of them just as well as if they were coins of pure gold. Now, Polo then continues to explain that in the lands of the Khan, foreign merchandise, gold, silver, pearls, or gems cannot be sold except to the Khan himself. For this, the Khan pays a liberal price with his paper money. So he buys such a quantity, and this is a quote again, so he buys such a quantity of those precious things every year that his treasure is endless, while all the time the money he pays away costs him nothing at all. And then Polo concludes, now you know that the great Khan may have, and in fact has, more treasure than all the kings in the world. And you know all about it and the reason why. So here's a, a pure instantiation uh, of the state theory of money. Now, in fact, um, it turns out when you read Seidel or other historians of the Roman Empire, that in the in the antique times already, even the Roman Empire, though it had sure had a sort of you know metalist theory of money, and so money had had to be hard, you know, gold standard, uh, and and so money was worth uh, the precious metal of what it of what it was made. Um, even though the Roman Empire and of course uh, all the political entities after that were sort of subscribing to that, at the same time. They also, let us say, with 10 or 20% or 30% once in a while, sort of implemented the state theory of money. So it was never really hard money. There was always a push by the emperor or by the, uh, by the prince to create money uh, of his own um, and to create political space uh, of maneuver with that. Now, one of the key reasons why in the West, the metalist theory and the liberal market theory of money um, was so strongly maintained 
even if not always in practice, but in any case in ideology, was that it helped to prevent civil war, right? So all the big concentrations of capital or, or power or wealth uh, in the West um, were sort of pacified if their wealth expressed in money terms was secure, right? And so what you have in the West, and in here I completely differ, um, I think with Jack Goody, uh, in anthropology. So Jack basically says uh, you have Eurasia, you have the Western part, you have the Eastern part, the sort of alternation, the inventions going on, and but basically all of it is ultimately the same. They learn from each other, they are not fundamentally different. I agree with the intention behind that theory entirely, I must say, but there is nevertheless one very fundamental difference between everything west of the Levant and almost everything east in the Levant. And that is that in the west of the Levant, west from the Levant, the land is owned privately. And the, from, the, from the Levant all the way to China, the land is claimed by the emperor. And that is, that's the fundamental difference. And so, so what you see from, uh, from Greek civilization onwards is very, very large concentrations uh, uh, of property and land. Um, and they became also, um, and Perry Anderson writes really well about that already in the 1970s, they become also a uh, sort of basis for uh, big financial wealth and for speculation and so on. Now, so what you see in the West is that you have historically this buildup of private consolidations of wealth. Um, and so the empires and the, the princes that emerged um, in the, in the Western part of Eurasia had to deal with that, these existing concentrations of wealth expressed in money terms very often. And so subscribing to the liberal ideology of money, metallism, hard money, hard money that's just from the market and that the state cannot simply produce was one way in which they could pacify uh, the large, the large uh, holders of capital, even when it was not yet capitalism. Now, in, 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 in particular in, in China, that was completely different, right? So every time, uh, every so many ages in China, um, there emerged uh, well, big concentrations of property, um, proto-capitalist, you can say, and they tend to be swept aside uh, by the Khan or by the rulers. Uh, they can be killed, they can be chased away. Um, in any case, there is a, is a, a much more a tension-ridden relationship between potential entrepreneurs, between potential private holders of wealth uh, and the empire. And it's in that context that the empire also feels free to more or less subscribe to a theory, to a state theory of money. Now, nevertheless, there is a particular moment in the history of the West where the state theory of money, as it were, yeah, you can say synthesizes, merges with liberal capitalist practice. And this is in fact in the making uh, of the United Kingdom, uh, the glorious revolution of 1688, um, and then the creation of the Bank of England, um, 1694. And you can, you know, very schematically, you can see it in such a way that from the late Middle Ages onwards, or the middle Middle Ages actually onwards, you have already big um, banking houses emerging within city states in Europe. And of course, Florence is, is, is a key issue, the Medici, but same as Venice, same as Genoa, uh, many other places, Geneva. And so the, the city states increasingly de determine. Um, uh, the space for capitalist development. And you see that the larger territorial uh, units, uh, more feudal units, and you increasingly learn from the city states. They also, in the beginning, certainly tend to lose the military fights with the city state. Um, and so, what you see is a gradual sort of financialization of Europe, where the big territories learn ever more, the city state game around banking, about money. 
Now, in the case of Venice, for example, Venice could, could easily just print money uh, in case of war. And it did so, and it could actually uh, build an evasive, you know, in the arsenal uh, outside of Venice, it could build in a high tempo new ships in order to, um, to make war in the East. And so there, there is a sort of state theory of finance uh, at, at work there. But the big case is, in fact, uh, the United Provinces of the Netherlands, um, where, which, at, you know, by, by 1648 sort of dominated the whole sphere uh, diplomatically and so on, but was increasingly uh, pressurized, um, in particular by, by France. And 1672 is a moment where it almost goes under, and it knows that it will go under at some point. That, that the uh, you know the sort of the, the bourgeoisie, the Amsterdam bourgeoisie, cannot protect itself from, uh, from uh, the military forces uh, that try to take it. And now, 1688 was always seen as the um, as glorious revolution as a revolution, as a liberal, as the bourgeois revolution in fact, as the bourgeois revolution in Europe. But historical research in the last 25 years um, has shown that it was primarily a Dutch military occupation. And it was a Dutch military occupation um, that allowed the sort of financial architecture of the Netherlands to be implanted in a new political entity called the United Kingdom. Um, and what happened was that, sure, that, that, that a massive flow of capital, merchant capital, began to flow into the UK uh, in order to make war against France, but then later in order to develop the whole transatlantic space and the colonies. And until about the end of the 18th century, so shortly before Napoleon, um, the debts of the United Kingdom were for about 50% financed by the Dutch. But the interesting thing is this. Uh, under, so, so what happened, in fact, was that the stadtholder of the Netherlands, so the military chief of the Netherlands, became the king of England. Um, in 1688, and under his protection and with him as the largest shareholder, the Bank of England starts to sell state debt in 1694. Now, this is a very interesting instantiation where in a capitalist and a liberal case, the state theory, the state theory of money becomes sort of integrated <coughs> into capitalist practice. And so what becomes possible now is that, that capitalists actually uh, invest in state debt that is then used to militarize uh, large spaces and to, uh, to, to turn them into capitalist development or the plantations, uh, colonization, uh, slavery, um, slave trade, um, and a massive expansion uh, of commerce going on. And all of this can be done because, and here's the key, um, because the state debt is a sort of infinite debt because the state um, can expand itself uh, over, over ever larger well, this, this state in particular can expand itself over ever larger distances, and a state cannot die. In other words, it, 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 they have a sort of um, infinite collateral. Um, and what you see is that the state debt of, so those who buy the state debt of the UK become big seigneurs, uh, and they start to, uh, to use their um, their credibility in relation to the state so the state owes them a lot of money and what they do is they loan that money out to others and so what you get is so, so that is credit money right and so there's a very very close connection between credit monies and the state debt and the, and the connection is basically being made by the banking houses that deal in the state debt and because they deal in the state debt they become, as it were, also infinite or eternal, not just a person who can die or who can refuse to pay uh, or can call in a debt at once. Um, now, all of this depends, in fact, 
And that is why you see probably most clearly how the state theory and capitalism merge here. Um, all of this depends on 1688, uh, the UK becoming a parliamentary republic, a parliamentary kingdom, right? And so what you have is a parliament um, of investors in the state that holds the king to it to paying back the credits that they give to the king. And the king itself, as I said, is in fact the biggest creditor to himself, right? As the biggest underwriter of the Bank of England. So you get a complete amalgamation uh, of, let's say, top bourgeoisie that runs the state, that makes the laws, um, and obliges the state to pay them back. Right? So, and so that is basically the capitalist. Uh, expansionary imperialist war machine uh, that's being set up in 1688 with the Bank of England 1694 as the key instrument, but the Bank of England, uh, the imperial state, um, and Parliament closely connected. So this is the bourgeois revolution, and what, so what you see in the bourgeois revolution is not just about democracy, right? But it's uh, primarily about a particular type of state finance nexus, the capitalist state finance nexus. And so it's basically, I would argue, the making of the capital state. Um, so a very, very important moment. And in fact, the merging uh, of capitalism, liberalism, and the state theory of money. Now, I jump very, very quickly. I, I, I could sort of fill out the episodes in between, but we don't have time for that. And the talk is already too big, right, in that sense. Um, but I just jumped to the state, to the emergence of the state theory, the discovery of the state theory of money at the end of the 19th century. Of course, it didn't happen first of all in the UK, it happened in Germany. Um, then it was taken over by, uh, by uh, um, I forgot his name and I don't know, yeah, by, so, so, Originally, the theory is, uh, is articulated by a German Knapp, um, and then Mitchell Innes, Innes takes it over, and then it flows into Keynesianism. Before Keynes wrote um, the general theory, he wrote a book about the origin of money, where he was very, very sort of state theory minded. And you can understand how Keynesianism depends on the capacity of, of the state to actually generate money and to generate uh, investment. Uh, cheap money um, that becomes targeted um, and in that way uh, keep um, uh, purchasing power up, but also um, leading to urban industrial development, etc. So the post-war Keynesian state um, in the West, um, but you can of course also say the socialist state in the East, was a state that embodied in many, many ways aspects of the state theory of money. Now, with the rise of new liberalism in the 1970s, uh, the, the sort of intellectual bankruptcy of Keynesianism, the state theory went totally when, you know, evaporated. By not, the 1980s, no one was repeating it anymore, no one was working on it, no one was believing in it, and you had a purely metalist, liberal, market-based theory of money. Um, so what you in fact have, it's, and it's a very, very interesting contradiction, at the moment, uh, where the US as the key hegemon over the capitalist system, 1972 and 1973 are a little bit earlier, but it's, you know, it's in phases, basically says that the dollar is now complete fiat money, right? So there's no connection to gold anymore. Um, at the moment that it becomes complete fiat money, and so you have the door open, 100% uh, open for the, the state theory of money. Neoliberalism comes in, to tell the state that, yeah, you know, you have fiat money, but you can't do it. It must be gold. It must be the gold standard. And so from that moment onward, neoliberalism, um, and you know, I have all the theorists that, that you know, I don't need to repeat them. Neoliberalism comes in to tell the state in, in a situation of pure fiat money, that money must be hard, that it cannot be printed, um, that the interest rate should be as high as possible. And that money must be scarce, right? 
Now, okay, then we have the whole neoliberal development, 1980s, all the way to 2007, we have the financial crisis. And that is basically the moment at which the state theory comes back a big time, but through the back door, namely via the central banks. And without, of course, the central banks saying that, hey, we are putting the state theory of money again uh, on a pedestal, and we're going to deny uh, the market theory of money and metabolism, um, money can just be printed. And that is the moment of quantitative easing. Um, and they, you know, after 2007, in a couple of ways, and you know, the, the ECB and the Fed, um, Japan, Switzerland, uh, and Bank of England are not exactly synchronized, but more or less synchronized. They start to produce about 25% of GDP of money that's simply printed, that's not covered by any sort of production. Um, and so, what you get is an enormous return of the state theory of money as an official practice without as such being theorized or ideologized by the still very neoliberal state. Right? So you can say that from 2007, basically till COVID, uh, until the pandemic, um, the West or the capitalist world lived in a particular type of denial of where money came from and where wealth came from and how economic growth, or in any case, uh, GDP was created. It was just created like in Song Empire in China uh, from money that is just printed on paper, right? And of course, it's not printed on paper anymore. It's just ditch, ditch the money like that. Um, COVID and the pandemic, I, I do two minutes more. Tomorrow. Yeah, oh, and but then I would still want to say something about war, but perhaps we should do that only after Chris has come in. Yeah. Um, so with COVID, you have authors like like Adam Tooze, who basically say that you know, look, this is this is the homecoming of the state theory of money because uh, you know quantitative easing goes off in a higher speed and to larger quantities than ever before. Um, let it, you know, if, if, in 19, if in 2019, about 25% of GDP, of OECD GDP, was simply printed in quantitative using money, in Song China, uh, sort of paper money, um, by 2021, it was already 40%. Uh, Switzerland, Japan, 100%, right? And so you have a massive uh, consolidation in fact, in the practical management of our societies um, um, of the implementation of the state theory of money. But of course, still, that does, did not sort of incorporate, articulate it in public ideologies, right? We are still sort of competitive. And we still think that, um, that productivity is basically driven by productivity increases um, that are that are imposed by scarce money, right? Because if money is not scarce, and everybody is just you know doing well, why would productivity be enforced upwards, right? And so we're now in a very very strange situation, um, in a sort of in a sort of wind bubble in a way, um, where our theories hardly reflect the practices of our economies and the specters of the economies are fundamentally rooted in what, cent what central banks are doing. Um, I want to say more, but I think I should just shut up at this point and give Chris the word. Um, but then we still want to come back to war, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you very much, John, for this interesting talk. And now we give go to our next speaker, Chris Hein. Thank you very much, Don. Good evening to everybody. I hope you can hear me sitting in a Cambridge kitchen. Uh, I would really like to be with you in Budapest tonight, but that wasn't possible. I think Karl Polanyi would have greatly enjoyed this magnificent historical vision that Don has given us, and it certainly fits very well with the global comparative mission of the Polanyi Center. So thank you, Don. This is not the occasion to tangle with any details, really, of your historical vision. 
one day perhaps I will come back and try to defend Jack Goody's approach because I don't think his idea of alternating leadership between East and West is incompatible with many levels of persisting difference over the millennia. Um, you are pointing to some important differences, uh, fully accepted. I think we agreed. I'm just going to throw in a few footnotes uh, because, because I didn't write a paper for the book that we're uh, advertising tonight. I'm not sure you showed the book, so let me show people a copy. <laughs> this is what it looks like. The product uh, in particular of six very able postdocs who worked with Don and myself in Halle between 2015, 2018, and the book came out uh, just a couple of years ago now. And the book exemplifies what anthropologists can contribute to all these issues. I mean, Don was stressing our discipline. His vision is very much an anthropological one. The volume that we co-edited gives, gives you lots of case studies to show how on the ground field working anthropologists can engage with these issues. So I thought I'd just mention a couple of a couple of, of contributions at that level. In particular, I think Don, we agreed. I'd say a word about China, which you touched on historically. Uh, the situation today has changed somewhat because, at least superficially, if we look at uh, China today, China in the last forty years since the reforms that began in the 1980s. Well, China is playing this financialized capitalist game more successfully than anybody. And in some ways, replicating history in Western countries in those liberal Northwestern European states in earlier centuries. I'm thinking of the basics of very high rates of saving in China in recent decades, both at the level of individuals and at the level of companies. Uh, of course, we have to face up to issues of indebtedness as well within China when we start looking more closely, but it was high levels of saving that enabled China to buy so many dollars over the decades and keep a world system afloat in which the most powerful country in the world, the United States, is not saving very much at all and totally dependent on its former Maoist socialist uh, rival uh, for keeping the system going. Um, that's a duality in world economy that perhaps anthropologists cannot engage with very significantly at that level. But Charlotte Brockerman, in one of the many fine chapters in our volume, contributes a case study where she looks at, in particular, what she terms green financialization. She looks at carbon trading markets in China. They have taken on board so much of neoliberal ideologies in the West. Uh, but of course, it plays out rather differently on the ground. And what Charlotte shows. Uh, in this it's, it's, it's very active section of financialization in China, perhaps not the section that many people are familiar with, uh, those social credit controls that affect over a billion people nowadays. But in her case study, Charlotte drew attention to some of the consequences on the ground of what looked like, looks like very uh, emancipatory rhetoric about the need to uh, plant more forests. When you look on the ground and see who is benefiting from green financialization, you find it's not the local people at all. It's uh, intellectuals, technocrats in distant cities. It's not a happy tale. It's not a tale of redemption, I think is the, the interesting word that she throws in at the end of her chapter. More generally in our volume, uh, there are several studies that draw attention to digital technologies. And this is one element, I think Don could fit this in very easily to his historical narrative, the digitalization that has taken place in recent decades, I think deserves ever more attention from our discipline. I think of my good friend Keith Hart back in the 1990s, embracing the new technologies as emancipatory because we could all uh, do what we wanted as individuals with money from now on. But in the new century, I think we have seen the inequalities, the digital enclosures, as some people term them. And you can certainly see that in China. Uh, Darren Byler has re written recently about the consequences in Xinjiang, which are of particular interest to me because that's where I do some field work in China. And yeah, what Byler calls terror capitalism is thoroughly integrated with today's globalized 
financialized capitalism around the world. It takes a particularly awful form in Xinjiang. Uh, that gives me an excuse to say something. It will just be a sentence or so, but the tragedy unfolding in Ukraine today is for me also a tragedy because it is a massive diversion from what I consider to be a, a much more dangerous threat to our long-term futures, namely the way in which this digitalized, financialized capitalism uh, takes an authoritarian form, a very vicious authoritarian form in contemporary China. Uh, no point, no time to develop any more of uh, the detailed notes that I brought along because we want to have a good half hour's discussion, I think. I'll just make one final point, really for the benefit of, of students in our audience uh, who would like more examples of how, uh, how relatively innocent ethnographers with only a, a, a basic background perhaps in economic anthropology, that's always useful to go back to some classics when it comes to, uh, to theories of money and Don did that in his talk. But Marek Mikush is a colleague of mine at the Max Planck Institute in Halle. He can't be with us this evening, but he's running a little group at the moment on peripheral financialization, as he calls it, in East Central Europe. There is work being done in Hungary. I'm not sure that his PhD student, uh, Bolaj, working in Gostoni Bolaj, is doing something in Hungary right now. He's in the middle of his field work. Uh, Marek himself is working in Bratislava, Pozsony. That's where he is this evening. And there are several others involved in this network. Please look up the Max Planck website for more up to date information about what is going on there concretely uh, in terms of showing how field working anthropologists can make a contribution, not just gathering new data at the micro level about in particular housing markets, that's been one major focus of attention, uh, very prominent in our edited volume, but also more generally indebtedness on the ground. And perhaps a final remark, just to complicate things a little bit because that's what anthropologists love to do. Uh, I do think our discipline is often going to be what Raymond Firth called the uncomfortable discipline, also when it comes to addressing these issues. Uh, I fully take on board everything that Don said about the importance of that Anglo-Dutch moment in the late 17th century, and yes, the importance of this Northwest European uh, impetus for everything that has come later, right down to the big bang of the 1980s, which you didn't really mention, Don, the hedge funds, the crisis of 2007, you didn't have time for all of those details. Uh, it sounds like a terribly bleak narrative. And certainly to many uh, young students that I've come into contact with, uh, they, they can't imagine anybody saying anything positive about any of this. And yet, and yet when you consider those Anglo-Dutch stories, um, not everything that came out of that financialization uh, can be written off as totally negative in terms of uh, emancipating human beings, expanding capacities. I'm sure, Don, you, you would agree with that very cautious formulation. Uh, I'm not suggesting students go away and read Niall Ferguson, for example, who about 10 years ago produced an extraordinary volume that was a, a, a defense of the most extreme liberal models, although even Ferguson had yeah. some sympathy with Shorosh and some negative words about market fundamentalism. Um, so even in those areas, you do find ambivalent comments. But once again, anthropology, bringing it back down to earth, take a look at the chapter by Deborah James in our volume, if you would like to see how field work on the ground may complicate matters. I am not suggesting for one moment that Deborah James co-authored fine chapter uh, refutes anything in the vision that Don has outlined. But she does show with evidence from South Africa, and the evidence is even stronger in some of Deborah's other publications and in her 2015 book, how for ordinary people to survive in local context in South African cities, uh, money, but debt, going into debt, a very high degree of financialization is essential in keeping life going. Uh, Don, that's uh, something you can come back on later if you wish to. Uh, I'm sorry, Deborah can't be with us tonight either, although I was talking to her earlier today. Uh, I will stop there in the hope of a good 30 minutes discussion. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Kate. And if you would like to know, I think you want to. I want to say some words about the work.
actually that whole war that prevented me from being, bringing the book. I wanted to give the book to you, but it, uh, I forgot about it because of this damned war. Um, but Chris makes a very beautiful point, and he brings me back to one of the things that I would have liked to say, but didn't have time to. Then, you know, if the state of your if financialization, if money can actually be printed like that, as it is, right? As it actually is at this point in time. It means that it is an object of intense political conversation, right? And so you can have people's points very easily, as you know, concept that in the 2010s began to circulate in the UK in particular. And so you, you can find all sorts of very democratic ways in which you can lay hold of that capacity, structure it in a way that is integrated, that repairs uh, earlier, well, some of the previous calls called them double polarizations, so class, class contradictions. And so there's a lot of policy to be made, democratic, um, pro-people's policy uh, of the left type and of the right type, right? Depending on, on how you pitch that policy, how you, how you ideologize it, how you conceptualize it, and how you implement it. Um, so the, the problem, of course, of the financialization and of the quantitative easing uh, of the 2010s was that the, the money generated by the central banks was basically only used uh, for big capital holders uh, to save their holdings uh, and to expand their, uh, uh, their properties. Um, of course, it also kept the economy, the Western, the global, the OECD, the Western economy going uh, to a big extent. Uh, the other driver of that was, of course, the growth of China. Uh, by the way, there's, there's, contest, there's discussion whether China actually also did some, it was not only uh, the savings uh, and not only productivity growth, but it was also some quantitative easing going on there quite probably. Anyhow, it's, you know, on the, in the West, it's quantitative easing that saved us after 2010. Um, in China, it's, it's ongoing urbanization and industrialization, but in particular urbanization. Um, There is a lot of potential contestation possible about what you can do uh, with the capacities that the state theory of money uh, explains for the state and for you know for democratic policies. But now I want to say a few things about the war. Um, you know, the war is in fact uh, a, a particular. I, I, it's, it's a structured outcome, not a necessary, but it's a structured outcome um, of a period of neoliberal financialized uh, capitalist growth, uh, which includes China, uh, of course. And it is so in a very, very particular way. Um, there's, there's a couple of arguments around that, but I just focus on the one that Jonathan Friedman um, produced already in the early 2000s, and he had a theory about double polarization. So this financialized growth, neoliberal financialized growth, creates an ever bigger class polarization, um, basically in all societies, right? Um, and we, we don't have any discussion about that anymore. There's, there's a worldwide um, polarization of classes going on, and, deepening inequalities between asset holders on the one hand um, and people without asset workers on the other. Um, that happens basically in all states, there are almost no exceptions. Um, Jonathan Friedman argued that if you have this going on in a context of globalization of capital, where the nation state cannot regulate capital anymore, uh, what you get is not a left-wing response to that on, the, on a domestic level, but you get a right-wing response. That was not his language, that's my language. But basically his vision was one um, that so increasingly you had a population that was being devalued uh, and degraded um, and would rather than embrace modernism, these are his words. Um, you can have a long discussion about how useful they are, but I, I think they are sort of orienting um, sensitizing, and you need to work them out further. And I did a little bit of that work in, in, in earlier work about the rise of the right. But nevertheless, 
they step out of modernity and they embrace a traditionalist vision of a golden past rather than a golden future of growth, right? And so that is what we have been seeing. So what you see is, is the emergence of neo-nationalist class alliances between um, a particular type of, you know, oligarchic type, rent-taking type uh, uh, of oligarchs or, or wealthy classes like Trump. Trump is a good example. But, you know, the people around uh, Orban are also a very good example. Um, so, so not necessarily in the competitive, globally exposed, uh, trade exposed uh, manufacturing sector or in high technology. They tend to be more, you know, in, in the liberal middle. Um, but it's an alliance between, it's a perverse alliance, a new nationalist alliance between these rent taking uh, oligarchies on the one hand and a would be middle class that is in fact not so much more than a working class uh, on the other. And so these new nationalist, uh, backward looking uh, political alliances um, are what we have been seeing, right? Over the last 20 years, basically everywhere in Europe and in many other places, uh, the US. UK and of course Brexit, all of that plays on. Now here, here's the thing. The Maidan was of course a very, very hybrid sort of mobilization. On the one hand, it was a global left-wing mobilization or liberal mobilization, like the ones that we were having here around the Mediterranean, Occupy Wall Street, same sort of people, the same sort of, you know, anarcho horizontal on horizontalist uh, modes of organizing and of uh, mythology. Uh, etc. But at the same time, it was already one of these new nationalist mobilizations that you had been having here too. Now, it was that new nationalist part that actually did the coup and made the revolution. And of course, they never really gained a lot of electoral votes after that. But they have become dominant and normalized. And so here you have an increasingly new nationalist, anti-Russian, uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, Russia, where Putin is actually balancing these interests very, very well, but also over time become ever more neo nationalist and anti Ukraine. Um, and then, of course, uh, it was always the case that, you know, in this financialized, new liberal, polarized, and uh, new nationalist world um, where China is coming up and industrializing very fast. Um, the US will be the retreating imperial power. But it's a retreating imperial, imperial power that has had its Trump interlude, right? And so, and of course, it has had its Afghanistan. And so Biden cannot compromise. Biden is, is Biden doubled down on imperial rhetoric, of course, never being willing to actually go into Ukraine and defend it. No one in NATO would ever sort of be willing to fight in Ukraine. It was always the case. But nevertheless, Ukraine had to have the right to become a member of NATO, right? And so this, this rhetorical uh, imperial fight, which is all about the, the neo-nationalist greatness of the US, also look at Johnson, uh, who did exactly the same. Um, France and Germany playing a very different role, right? So you have you have massive contradictions within NATO here over the last 20 years. It, you should be aware of that. And I think they might also furnish uh, more in the open in the, in the next years, no doubt. Uh, but nevertheless, a declining um, US empire that uh, the president of which had nevertheless to emphasize its imperial logic, it could not compromise, and then two neo nationalist states uh, that are clashing with each other. Um, so, th this is the wider context in which the war uh, becomes a possibility, right? A structured possibility. But of course, it's not an explanation of why it exactly happens now in this particular way. But these are the forces behind it. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for this talk and your evaluation of this current, current dynamic. But unfortunately, we're limited with time and we need to move on the question parts from the audience. I ask our online audience to write their questions in the chat box somewhere. I will read it out loud. Um, and also our in-person audience, if you have any questions, we're really encouraged to ask. 
Speak up because my ears are not stupid. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I'm talking about sorry to origins of money. So we mean from anthropology perspective. And what would be your evaluation about this? Is there some fundamental difference between Soviet money and for two phase we are in, but if you can talk to people about money in Soviet Union and money in the West. I'm just trying to, to, to add something to this as well. So I think uh, this was one of the questions I also wanted to ask, uh, socialism and money. And very importantly, related to your point concerning ownership. Yeah. So because that I think is very important to, to speak about. And of course, socialism was, was different in, in various periods. But that's a, a very pertinent question. Can you repeat the question? Sure, I, I haven't heard it very well. I'm sure it's a nature of money in Soviet Union, but also apply at the, the, the different variations in Soviet Union. So socialism and money, right? That was the question. Uh, Thank you, right? So <laughs> let's let's. Okay, I still don't get it. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, how to, into your historical narrative yeah. how can you put socialism oh okay and oh, okay. money okay. right in, okay, into exactly. the two, yeah. two things right because yeah. that's important yeah, big theory good. of money very and good. so on and so on right so that's very, very good it. very simple and very good question thank <laughs> you very much sorry but my ears are just so bad um and i, I just come out of an airplane and then it's, it's even worse and then so some some letters I simply don't hear. So the, the S of socialism, <laughs> I, I couldn't get it. But now I have it because I think a lot about socialism, to be honest. Um, yeah. Well, you, you, you can actually say, in a way, that, that Song China was you know, one of these pre modern socialist cases, in a way, a repression. Um, of capitalism, a repression of capitalists, um, the state as the ultimate embodiment of society um, and, and the generator of its wealth, including its money. Now, I, I know that you might like not to hear about the state and socialism. And I also don't like so much the state and socialism, but nevertheless, I think there is no socialism imaginable, even a very democratic socialism, without a state. I cannot imagine that. Um, now, of course, in the historical state socialisms, um, it, it is very clear that they embodied in a very pure sense the state theory of money, right? And so, but then you get rather than the market determining the values, you get a, a central planning agency determining the values, and then you get the old discussions about, you know, how correct can they be? Uh, you know, the, the discussions of the 1940s and 50s, etc. Um, I would say, and this, this, this connects it with things that I would have liked to bring in my talk to. Um, and the war, Chris already said that the war is a distraction, a very cruel and a very, very perhaps terrible distraction, certainly terrible, um, from the green transition that we need to do, right? And the green transition can be very capitalist, or it can be a rather socialist green transition. That depends very much on where the money comes from. And who can claim ownership and property over the new green energy? 
right? And the, green, the new parts of the new green economy and the green technologies and so on. Now, what we have seen in COP26 and all the you know, sort of writing uh, that developed around it, uh, Mark Carney's book with the title Value is a very good example of that. I was completely shocked that a year after COVID, a year after so much quantitative easing was done in order to deal with a calamity, the bigger calamity that is coming has to be solved entirely without it and in an entirely liberal capitalist way because it must be a business case. Right? And so here's where, this, where your socialism issue comes back again. If we want to have a green transition that is also a path out of the competitive new liberal unequal financialized capitalism that we have, then we need to sort of appropriate the capacity of the state to generate money, to create ideologies and political programs around that. This 40% of GDP or 100% in Japan, we can actually, that's us, right? We can take it and we can direct it into particular directions and we can invest it. And we can actually, you know, we can actually get more value out of it. But perhaps a different sort of value than pure capitalist surplus value, right? And so here the socialism issue comes big, comes back big time, uh, as far as I see. And here you also see the problem of the of the two. I mean, the 2010s are ideologically speaking almost uh, a wasted period, right? Given that such fundamental changes. Um, around financialized capitalism have been happening without us actually articulating them uh, as explanation, as political programs, appropriating them and seeing what we can do with it, like people's quantitative easing, all of that has to remain peripheral for the left. Uh, so we are, we are all still a very old social democratic 20th century left, as if we are still industrial societies, right? Um, but we are not that anymore. We're globalized, financialized, and we need a green transition. There is a question to Chris. Hello, whether Chris would like to comment the question. Uh, 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 Chris, would you like to comment this reply uh, from Dan? Well, only perhaps to continue this thread, I think I'm in full agreement with Don. Uh, I read a lot these days about a Green New Deal. Um, it's usually linked to notions of degrowth. We haven't yet talked about COVID, about the pandemic. My impression is that uh, governments worldwide are so determined to get back to growth as rapidly as possible that the prospects for a Green New Deal have receded in recent years. But I don't know how Don sees that. It may be an interesting thread for us to discuss further. I do think a Polanyian approach uh, is obviously congenial to uh, a lot of the discussions uh, about a Green New Deal, green transition, whatever you call it. But the prospects right now, post COVID, do not seem to me very positive. And there's another question from Andrea. Speaking to the. <laughs> okay. So uh, I have uh, two questions and one comment uh, concerning socialism. I think it's very important to differentiate state theory of money with large scale private capital and without large scale capital. And that's also a very interesting question how it's related to markets which are not based on large scale private capital, but different ones. So I think that would be just one thing to think about yeah. to make the narrative even more interesting yeah. uh, because that, that would be an answer to, to a lot of concerns. So that would be the comment. Yeah. The question. Uh -huh. uh, I agree with the comment. Okay. <laughs> the, the question uh, is uh, whether I, uh, whether you agree with this or not. So that, that this is the type of question. So isn't that that the neoliberals actually were not 
you know, you are right. It's very ambiguous how they position themselves. But I think their answer to the money problem was twofold. One is securing private property as much as possible, plus the commodification of money. That is to say, in the commodification of credit, mm -hmm. which was a very big step as opposed to everything else. So Hayek was thinking about that the monopoly of the national bank should be forgotten, right? The market can produce it. So whether you would agree that, that there's a commodification yeah. theory of that as well. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that entirely. But it is a little bit like, like 1694, right? So, so under the neoliberalism, um, all property holding, the value of property is guaranteed by the scarcity of money. So there's no inflation, right? Um, I forgot what I wanted to say. Um, but at the same time, there is a contradiction. And, it's, and, and again, that one is not really well articulated. And so, so you have a commodification money going on. You don't have you know, a sort of Keynesian state that, that flows money into the economy and society and has a plan. No, there's no plan. There's just a market. And so it, the market generates the money. The trouble is two things. If it goes wrong, it comes on the cost of the state, right? And that's what happened in 2007, 2014. Um, but more importantly, perhaps, there is something like, look, capitalism and certainly Hayek um, and Friedman presents capitalism as an entrepreneurial capitalism, risk taking. But that is, that is a lie, <laughs> right? And the lie is basically in the state guy. So the core of capital is the state guy. Who owns the state up? Because that is the guaranteed part of capital. And on the, on the basis of the guaranteed part and the interest rate that you get on your loans to the state, you can take risks, right? And so, so what we've seen in the last 30, 40 years is like after 1688, you have an enormous credit expansion, but the credit is ultimately generated because it is rooted in the, in the certainty of the payments that the holders of the state get, get, right? And so there is, so the state is the, is, the, is the source of infinite credit. And of course, it's not really infinite, right? But it can be 100% in debt. It can, a state can be 400% in debt, right? That's the, uh, the Japanese state is now 250% in debt. But the Japanese population is 500 percent of that. Well, you know, perhaps it can be 700 percent. Nobody knows that. You also remember that um, not so long ago, there was a basic consensus among economists that if a state would be indebted for 100 percent of GDP, it would be lost. Right? That state would be just banned by capital, and it would never be able to pay its debt back. It would only the debt would only grow. Well, by now, you know, almost all Western states are above 100 percent. Um, so all of this is relative. Um, there are no absolute norms in this. These are relative power relationships, but essential for capital in all cases remains the state debt as the, the fundamental sort of guarantee for the value of capital. And then of course the interest rate, right? So the interest rate on the state debt is basically the risk-free return on capital. Right? You simply buy a, a treasury uh, obligation, a T-bond, and you can sit back. You don't care what they do with it. You can sit back and you get that percentage. Um, and then after you know, 10 years or five years or 30 years, you get the whole capital back, plus all these percentages and compound, right? Um, so there's something very interesting about the interest rate. And we should perhaps also talk about interest rates because that is the other big issue now, right? So I am very suspicious about the push towards high interest rates and the, the, the conversation at this moment in time about inflation. 
So inflation is now the big sort of danger coming to us. And of course, the war is going, is going to drive it up very hard because uh, the oil price is going up, gas prices will be going up. There will be a problem with buying Russian gas in the future. So, you know, energy in Europe will certainly be, you know, 20%, 30% more expensive. That's 20%, 30% inflation. Does that mean that our central banks are going to push up the interest rate to 15, 15%, 20%, like, like the Volcker shock in 1980? If they do that, that is a massive shakeout of the economy, right? It basically means that 50% uh, of actors who are deeply indebted are now bankrupt, right? like in the 1980s and that was the moment in which socialism started to collapse and the global south emerged instead of the third world because of the state dance and the focus shock and the, so we have a very interesting thing i'm completely suspicious about the talk about inflation and the need for high interest rates um because it is so because i feel it is a step up towards a purely capitalist dream transition. And you probably understand why I'm saying this. So if you have now already increasing inflation, we will have the green transition will increase inflation. And everything that the left wants requires inflation. We want higher wages. We want higher prices for meat, right? We want higher wages in China and in the global south. We, we want states to increase uh, the expenditure on education, et cetera, et cetera. We want to guarantee <laughs> the pensions. All of this costs money, right? Um, and so everything that the left vision for the near future um, uh, is, is in fact inflation producing. Um, and the green transition will be desperately inflation producing because there will be a big gap in time between um, the availability of, you know, on a large scale, on a sufficient scale of green energy um, and the decline in the old sources of energy, right? Because there's no investment going on in oil and gas and so on. And so in the next 10 or 20 years, inflation will inevitably be a problem um, if you want it to be a problem if you cannot deal with it and of course capitalism cannot deal with it only by increasing the the interest rate right because that guarantees uh the value of capital and the value of property and otherwise inflation reduces the value of capital and the value of property so so i'm very suspicious when you look at the us in the in the us much of the inflation is actually explained by the price of secondhand cars. I mean, is that something that you would increase the interest rate on? In Europe, much of the inflation is explained by the rise of the energy cost, which is, which is geopolitical. Uh, uh, it's a geopolitical issue, and it's, it's basically the war, and it's Russia, right? And so, um, are we going to punish ourselves because of that? So, so here are a couple of issues, and then they are, they will be ever more important in the near future. Just as a follow up, I think it's very interesting what you are saying, uh, because it might mean that you you solve some kind of a problem. So you say, so up till now the states have been pouring, especially the core states, which are failing. Uh, because they're failing yeah. in a lot of ways. This is why they're pouring money like crazy yeah. into the whole system because they can't handle the whole yeah. situation. This means that this is going to be solved through the inflation and not through a financial crash. Yeah. So, because the other theory would be yeah. that as all the money is financialized, even manufacturing companies are, you know, just they're not producing profit out of production, but they're just basically pouring money into the financial market. So that's not going to be happen because the inflation is able to eat it up, yeah. right? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Yeah, it's a good point. That's it. Well, I also have a question. Uh, you mentioned several times the problem. Can, can, can you do it? Yes. Yeah, okay. then I hear it better. Yes, yes. Yeah. So you mentioned several times 
you can make that play clearly the indebtedness of i mean not only of individual households mm -hmm. or individual people but also the states that they inhabit that sort of generalized inhabited in uh, indebtedness does indeed produce uh, out migration mm -hmm. that that is uh, um, we don't have generalized theories about this but there's a lot of um, you know, piecemeal insight on that. Uh, for example, about uh, the Baltic countries, um, where you know half, half of migration is basically explained by the, by, by the deep indebtedness of people, and indeed uh, people that that flee their debts, right? So they they go out so that they don't need to pay them back. Um, yeah. So so these are these are certainly um, large scale processes that are deeply structured uh, in society right they're not individualized these are social forces and so it's it's quite paradoxical i was talking about financialization and Friedman's double polarization um, which produces these neo-nationalist uh, reactions over time i think hungary is a great example of that um, but then again migration is also produced by that and it feeds into the neo-nationalist uh, processes and so yeah, so you, you have you have feedback loop here. And thanks for uh, for saying that. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have a question from the audience, so it's just a remark. Uh, David Carr says that inflation can also be controlled with taxes, not only higher interest rates, but that would require a different state society relationship away from the rentier relation between asset holding uh, middle classes and central banks and the financial sector. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, 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 I totally agree. That's a very good point. Um, I mean, the, the sort of baseline is that that panic about inflation, um, if you cannot take it into a left-wing position, um, it will be a sort of pro-capitalist strategy, right? And so you, you really, so at, at the moment that you have more inflation and a panic around inflation, then you actually need a really good left-wing theory about how you can how you can you know generate money, uh, public money, people's quantitative, how you tax, where you invest it in, uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And if if you don't have that complex of that that complex uh, set of thoughts uh, as an alternative political program, there will be a capitalist um, Cold strategy, pushing up the interest rates, higher competition, uh, etc. So yeah, so we are at the bifurcation moment in in that sort of a political sense, and I also think we are very very badly prepared. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There is another question from the audience. Yes. Can you come here? Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. You can put it up immediately. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and if I don't promise you, okay, I just want to know uh, your reflections about the uh, many hierarchies when we are talking about the financial globalization. Uh, and uh, uh, we're talking a lot about how many are affected at different levels, and especially in the third world countries where. Uh, uh, none of these two theories are really at work, or maybe working in a different dynamics. Uh, I'm, I'm dwelling on the Ethiopian example, for instance, that every time the government comes to power, then they have to print a new money. And then for that, they have to pay billions of dollars. Yeah. And then they pay that to the Western countries. Yeah. And then they have to suffer, like the, the 
processes that goes on. Uh, and so in a way, not only the um, uh, vicious circle of authoritarianism, but also vicious economic circle uh, of AIDS. Yeah. Uh, and so I just want to know that that's the kind of uh, well, yeah, it's, 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 it's very good that you bring up the Global South in this. Um, it's been quite remarkable how states like Brazil uh, or South Africa, um, Indonesia, even the Philippines, have been able to do some quantitative easing on their own, of their own, uh, under COVID. That is a completely new development. Um, and the important thing here is, you know, sometimes the IMF is useful. Very often, it's of course, absolutely not. But the IMF has in the in the 2010s, after the financial crisis, increasingly emphasized that bigger global South states sell their state debt in their own currencies rather than in dollars. Uh, that is what they have done. Uh, at the same time, of course, many of the of the emerging markets, uh, so middle income countries in the global South. Uh, have quite a, a big export surplus nowadays because they have industrialized, right? Um, so th that makes the combination of these two things. So an export surplus and having a state debt, state debt in your own currency makes apparently an enormous difference for the sort of sovereignty that you can mobilize on behalf of your own population, uh, emancipation, welfare, uh, education, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the, a couple of things have been going in, in a way quite well, but of course, I mean, COVID is an enormous shakeout between the North and the South. Uh, it's an absolute scandal that even the $20 billion that was necessary um, um, for, uh, for COVID in the Global South uh, never really furnished, right? I mean, uh, given that at the same time, the Northern states, uh, basically produced how much was it about 15 trillion dollars uh, in in you know money for nothing they could not even spend 20 billion dollars on uh, vaccinating the global south and then it blew back and so i mean you know capitalism is such an uneven thing that even though it's an absolute interest of the global north to vaccinate the global south they cannot do it <laughs> and yeah, so so in that sense, there's still there's still a lot of sort of to learn about internationalism, and we need to look back again at the 1960s, 1970s left internationalism, um, certainly also with an eye on, uh, on on that on that green transition at that, right? Um, as you know that. The North has promised about a hundred billion per year uh, repair, basically to you know to repair damages that the green transition does to global South nations. Um, it's only generating about fifty percent of that. So, so all in all, you see that with the capacity to actually generate money, all that money is basically being claimed by rentier interests in the North, right? But there are so many great things to spend it on that we have an absolute objective and universal consensus about that it should be spent on. But then we need to sort of appropriate the capacity to generate money and do it. The 20 billion and the 100 billion is nothing in the light of the 15 trillion. Or, for example, the one and a half trillion in, uh, in Bitcoin, right? Which, which is, you know, nothing, <laughs> literally. But it's one and a half trillion. And you cannot generate the 20 billion to vaccinate the global south. This is all about capitalism and unevenness and uh, state power. With Don, who I could hear very clearly just now, and I subscribe to everything that he said. And my main contribution this evening has been to make a modest contribution to the green transition by not flying to Budapest. Uh, have a nice evening, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for participating and attending this event. And on this note, I hope you all enjoyed it and enjoyed the discussion that followed after.
Thank you very much and goodbye everyone. Bye. Bye. How are we going to? Very good. <laughs> yeah, I need a beer. <laughs> <laughs>